Hello, ladies. How are you today? I tell you, it is beautiful here in Minnesota. The sun is out. We're enjoying a nice crisp day. As a matter of fact, today's topic is called What is Up with the Weather? Caring for Creation. And my name is Sugbury, and I'm the host of Him for Her Radio Women's Hot Topics. Hey, ladies, you can find us on YouTube now. You want to watch, you want to see our guests, you want to see the face expressions, you want to get into this interview. I encourage you to go to YouTube, Him for Her Radio Women's Hot Topics, and look us up. We have got a great show today. In fact, I am just honored to have these two guests on with me. But ladies, before I introduce them, let me ask you a couple questions if I could. Do you have a child or a grandchild, maybe yourself, that has asthma? I know I have asthma. How about autism, ADHD, allergies, ladies, Lyme disease, cancer? Guess what, ladies? It could be our climate that is impacting yours or your children's health. What about the storms? What about fires? What about earthquakes that are happening today? Are these direct from God or a result of our lifestyle decisions? Listen in, ladies, today as we explore these hot topics with our two guests. Today, I have Mitch Hescox. Am I saying that right, Mitch? Your last name? Hescox Um, is correct. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul Douglas, the meteorologist. And I'm going to introduce both of my guests, of which I can't wait for you guys to meet. Now, Paul Douglas does not need any introduction because he's from uh, he's been in Minnesota a long time. But did you know that Paul Douglas's birth name is Douglas Paul Kruhofer? How did that happen, Paul? An accident of birth. Hey, Shug. Good morning. <laughs> um, yeah, when I when I first got into radio in Pennsylvania, not far from where Mitch lives, my first radio station, the boss said, "What's your name?" And I said, "Doug Kruhofer." And there was a long pause. He goes, "Oh, that's not going to work." He said, "Our DJs can't even say their own names." I said, what's your middle name? I said, Paul. He said, okay, today, from today on, if you want $25 a weekend, you're going to be Paul Douglas. So it stuck. And I, once I changed it, I couldn't change it back, but it's a long story. You can call me whatever you want. I love it. I love it. You know, uh, friends, we're just blessed. I, as I had told him earlier, uh, when we first started, I said, I feel like I already know you. I mean, I've been listening to you over all these years and, and it's I, I'm just like puzzled. He doesn't know who I am because I've been watching him all these years. I'm just so blessed, Paul, to have you on our show. It's an honor. Thank you, Shug. And I appreciate your interest in this topic. We both Mitch and I do. You know where this came from, ladies, is that we did a Bible study uh, with some girlfriends. Um, we have a group called Discerning Women. And um, Katie, who is Paul's neighbor, told me about this book. Now, if you're on you, YouTube, ladies, I want you to see this book right here. It's called Caring for creation and um, the evangelicals guide to climate change in a healthy environment. Um, And I can't wait to get into the book, but Paul, tell us a little bit about your history, your past, and you are kind, you know, you're kind of a self-claimed gadget guru. You love to put things together. You're an entrepreneur. Can you tell us a little bit about your past? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm a Christian. I accepted Christ when I was 13 and uh, that you know, how can that not flavor my outlook about life and and this amazing gift we've been given, uh, the gift of creation, the gift of life. So I'm a a meteorologist. It was uh, Tropical Storm Agnes back in 1972. It flooded my boyhood home in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Hmm. put the fear of God in me and filled me with a lot of curiosity and questions. Went on to get a degree in meteorology at Penn State and uh, had a little business on the side at Penn State giving weather forecasts to radio stations and construction companies. And one TV station in Northeastern PA, where they didn't have meteorologists, they wanted me to advise their on-air people and make sure they got the forecast close. (laughs) And one day I got a chance to fill in. That led to a job uh, in Northeastern PA. And then I hopped around the country, wound up Thankfully, in Minnesota, where I've spent the majority of my career, uh, raised two kids, started a a number of companies, always had a a fascination with technology and the weather. And for me, um, Shug, the 
the sweet spot is sort of the intersection of meteorology and technology and increasingly climate is a big part of that story. Amen. And you are kind of a celebrity. You were on Jurassic Park. How did you get on that gig? Well, thankfully, they, they didn't put me on. They put my graphics on. One of my previous companies was called Earthwatch, and we did three-dimensional weather graphics. And somehow, to this day, Shug, I don't know how Spielberg found out about us. We're a tiny little Minnesota company. But uh, we got a call from one of Steve's people who said, you know, we're making this little movie called Jurassic Park. And Mr. Spielberg wants a high tech, innovative way to show this storm moving into Jurassic Park. Would you be interested in making your graphics available? So we did that. That was cool. A few years later, they called back and said, we're making a little movie about tornadoes. It's called Twister. We'd like to use your graphics. And I did get a line, one line in the movie Twister. And um, it's, okay, you ready? Yes. Hey, Bryce, you better come here and take a look at this. <laughs> you so, nailed it. You nailed it. Well, that was awesome. <laughs> after the ninth take, they said, all right, it's good enough. I think we can use it. But um, yeah, it was it was fun. It, it's been a great ride made possible by great people. I've surrounded myself with people a lot smarter than I am who can take some of my crazy ideas and turn them into viable companies. And I, the older I get, Shug, the less I take for granted. Uh, yeah. It's been a blessing working with great people. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. And we have Reverend Mitchell Hescox, and he is a president and CC CEO of the Evangelical Environmental Network, EEN, if we refer to it as that. It is a ministry that educates, inspires, and mobilizes Christians in their effort to care for God's creation. You can find them, friends, at creationcare.org. Now, Mitch, he's a, he's a pretty stellar kind of guy, ladies. I want you to listen up. When I was reading the chapters, you could tell which one's uh, we're coming from his voice, and you just get moved closer to the Lord when you're reading this book. Mitch guides a team representing over 4 million pro-life Christians who understand climate change has the greatest moral challenge of our time and the greatest opportunity for hope in building sustainable prosperity for all. He has testified friends before Congress, spoken as well at the White House, and is quite frequently quoted in the national press. He once worked in the coal industry, which gives him a whole new perspective on this topic. And where his heart beats, at least what I could see as I was reading and learning more and more about him, is that he speaks out on environmental life, threatening and the impacts that it has on the people who are poor and impoverished. Thank you so much, Reverend Mitchell Hescox, for coming on with us today. It is truly my honor, Shug. I'm glad to be here and glad to share a little bit about my story and about faith and why God calls us to care for his creation. Because remember, it's his, not ours. Yes. And you have a beautiful family. Uh, mm -hmm. You told me that you have, uh, you're married, you have a wife mm -hmm. and four children. Four children and seven grandchildren. And, and seven uh, grandkids. The, the youngest three spent uh, Saturday night at our house. So we had a lot of fun. And then we made homemade sticky buns before we did worship on online on Sunday morning. So that was a lot of fun baking with my little grandkids. You know, so. so as you guys are thinking about this book and you're putting this book together, you're not thinking of yourselves. You're not thinking about, you're thinking about the future children to come. But before we get to that, Mitch, can I ask you a question? Sure. Something happened to you on Thanksgiving weekend when you were camping as a youth. Can you share that with us? Yeah, actually, it was my first semester in college at the University of Arizona, where I went literally to run away from God and his call to ministry. And we were out, it was the Friday after Thanksgiving in 1975. And I was in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. And it was becoming twilight. And as I walked, was walking back to camp, I came across this giant saguaro, the cactus with the two arms. And right behind it was a giant red, red sun. And all of a sudden, my eyes teared up. Um, I got emotional. I literally got down on the ground and my mind saw that Saguaro is being the cross of Jesus and that red sun being not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. Wow. And I gave my life back to Christ right then and there because I was struggling. It was the 60s. God was dead, the late 70s. And it was a profound moment in my life and surely has influenced me now 
as I spend full time in ministry, caring for God's creation and all of God's children. Wow. What a, look at how God already was just prompting your heart mm -hmm. to follow him and, and, and make a bigger impact in his kingdom. Praise mm -hmm. God. Um, I understand that both you and Paul met in D.C., is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We actually met part of Paul became a board member of another group that I was part of called the National Religious Partnership for the Environment. And we got to know each other and became really great friends. And he actually stole him. And he's now on EEN's board of directors. And so we're glad of that. But you know, we've had a lot of fun together. We, um, you know, Paul's a Penn State alumni. Two of my children are Penn State alumni. I grew up 30 miles from Penn State. So when we can see football games, um, we go to football games together in the fall, which is a lot of fun. And, you know, Paul's wife and me are probably the most exuberant fans. We sort of get into it in those games. So, you know, uh, so we yes. just stand up and be, and be rowdy and have fun. But uh, I, we're great friends. And, you know, one of the great stories about this book is that Paul was on his way to see his dad in Lancaster County back in August a few years ago. And we literally sat down at our dining room table and outlined the book in about three hours. And we each went back and wrote our separate chapters in two months or less. And that was it. I mean, it was a really inspired moment. We just came together. And I think that was because we know each other and we're really yeah. fast friends. Great respect oh, for one another. I love it. And again, friends, the book is called Caring for Creation. You can find it on Amazon. And the first five people who go to our website, himforher.org, and put in the info line, Caring for Creation, I will send you a free book compliments of him for her ministries. This is a wonderful book and I highly recommend it. I'm not here just to promote the book. I'm here because we have a voice, gentlemen, right now to tell these women like it is what's happening in our creation. Can you please tell me what is the purpose of you even wanting to write these books, this book? Well, for me, it's really all about children's health. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, as you outlined in the beginning of the show, not only is climate a future threat, but the same thing that causes climate fossil fuels and our use of it is a very big current threat. Right now in the United States, there's something called PM 2.5. That's the fancy name. It's soot, fine particles of dust that float in the air. One in five women in the United States have premature pregnancies, premature births of their pregnancies because of that P PM 2.5. Mm. And in the African American community, because they're more impacted by pollution, it almost doubles to one in eight. Excuse me, it's the other way around. One, one in eight to one in five. So pollution kills right now. You know, around the world, you talked about the majority world, more people die in the world today from pollution than tuberculosis, malaria, or AIDS combined by three, three times. And 10 times more people die from pollution than all forms of violence. Wow. And it's just going to get worse as we talk about food scarcity and everything else if we don't get our act together and work on climate change. Now, and ladies, now, ladies, as you're listening, I don't want you to turn the channel. I want you to think to yourself, this, I don't want you to say this is too big of a project. We can't, I, I can't deal with that. I'm going to shut this off. No, I want you to listen because we can make an impact for our own kids today and generations to come. Um, Paul, you had said uh, something kind of humorous. You said our weather has the flu. The atmosphere and oceans are running a low-grade fever. You tell us not to look at the weather thermometer for evidence of warming, but to look at your yard for tangible signs of slow-motion warming trend. What do you mean by that, Paul? Sure. I mean, look, we are, Shug, we are conditioned as human beings. I think we're wired to respond to day-to-day -day weather. Okay, you look out the window. Is it cold? I'm going to need a jacket. Oh, I can wear shorts. We're not wired to experience longer term changes in climate. So, and that's why we have climate scientists. I'm a scientist, I'm a meteorologist, I'm not a climate scientist, but I saw 20, 25 years ago, over time, over the span of many years, what I thought were the thumbprints of a changing climate. I too was skeptical and I think it's natural for all of us to be skeptical. How could something that man does ultimately change the climate? Only God can do that. That's, that was the mindset that I came from. And I was skeptical in the 80s and most of the 90s. And then I started noticing, Shug, that the weather increasingly was playing out of tune, that I was seeing things 
that I had not seen before. The patterns mm -hmm. were changing. The rain was falling harder. The growing season was getting longer. Humidity in the summer was higher. So the heat index was higher. Winter snow in Minnesota, unreliable. You used to be able to bank on snow on the ground from late October right through March. But I noticed over time that our snowfall patterns were changing. So it was the weather. It wasn't Al Gore. It wasn't a documentary. It wasn't even scientists that got me off the dime. It was the weather playing out of tune that got me to pay attention to the climate science. It wasn't an overnight epiphany, but over the span of many years, I came to the realization that climate change, it's not a future thing 30 years down the road. It's happening now. And this is not about polar bears, as much as I'm pro-polar bear. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about our kids and their kids and what we leave behind to future generations and the responsibility that we have as Christians to see the world as it is and to see our role as stewards and to try to make things better as Christ would do, as he did on this planet. He tried to make things better. Um, we are supposed to be Christ-like and take actions that make things easier for our kids and their kids. And by ignoring it, by looking away, by denying it, you're not doing your kids any favors. Amen. Amen. You know, um, in the book, you talked about weather and climate. Could you just explain to our listeners what the difference is between those two words? Sure. It, it is confusing. Weather and climate, sugar, are flip sides of the same coin. Weather is day-to-day -day changes. And as meteorologists, we try to predict those day-to-day -day changes in weather for a given location. And we can look out one week, sometimes trends out a couple of weeks, but forward-looking. Climate is really the accumulation of weather events over time. Think of it as a movie. In a, in a theater, uh, the entire two hour movie would be climate. If you take a single frame, a single snapshot, that would be the weather. Weather mm -hmm. is CNN headline news, climate is the history channel. So it's the ability to step back and look for trends. Is it getting drier? Is it getting wetter? Is it getting hotter? How are things changing over time? And is this natural variability? The climate has always changed. Ever since the Garden of Eden, the wet, you know, the climate has changed due to a variety of, of uh, things like changes in solar radiation, the amount of sunlight reaching the earth, volcanic eruptions. We've had big climate changes. We've had ice ages, yes. Uh, no question about that. But this time around, it would appear based on all the evidence, on the science, on the data, that we are the ones nudging the climate in a warmer, wetter, more volatile, volatile direction. So I'm glad you brought that up because we are wired to think about the weather. It's a little harder to step back and look at the long-term changes. That is what climate is. Hmm. You know, in Psalm 24, 1, it says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Now, I'm going to preempt that with ladies. I don't want you to be saying, hey, are we going to be worshiping creation? No, we're not. We're worshiping the creator, but we are responsible for this beautiful earth that he gave us. Um, in our book club, one of the women um, named Elizabeth said she appreciated the comment that you wrote in the book, gentlemen. We live in God's creation and as stewards have a holy obligation to treat it as the remarkable gift that it is. You both talk about politics quite often in this book, liberals and conservatives. Why can't there be unification on this topic of caring for creation, especially among Christians across the aisle? Well, I think there should be. And that's one of the things that I do every day is try to explain that, that this is not a political agenda. It's an act of discipleship. I mean, one of the things that I turn to is Isaiah 24 says, you know, human beings destroy the earth because it's, they don't follow God's commandments. Mm. And it's really not about the earth because the earth will eventually take care of itself. It's about God's children. 
whether you can grow corn for the first time ever in North Dakota, which has happened in the past three years, never before happened in recent memory, mm. to the people in Africa that are forced to move. One person right now is forced to move every two seconds because of climate change. Food insecurity, water insecurity, the destruction of forests, loss of habitat. The food supplies around the world, our population is growing, but because of climate change, food production, especially among grain cereals around the world is declining. But we can do something about it. That's the hope part. We believe in God. Jesus said we can do greater things than these. And I think that's the primary message that I wanna get is we have to stop listening to the naysayers and mm -hmm. listen to what the Bible says what God is commanding us, and then act on following Jesus. I mean, I believe very strongly that in the resurrection moment, the way John's gospel tells it, Jesus says, hey, folks, follow me. I want to build a new world. I want to build your kingdom. And let's get off your duts, duffs and go do it. <laughs> I mean, even in the, the book of Acts, you know, when Jesus, you know, returns to heaven, you know, all the disciples are sitting there looking up at the heaven. And then finally, the angel says, hey, folks, you know, you're looking the wrong way. Go and do your work. Go and pray, get filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what the church has to do. It has to, you know, get rid of politics and say, this is a biblical matter. And we have to act on it before it's too late. Because if we don't turn down our carbon emissions in the next 15 years, we are really going to doom a lot of God's children that are literally a life in hell. Mm. And I don't want to do that. Neither do I. You know, we got to see Jesus face to face. We have to be held accountable for what he's given us to care for. You know, I think probably, gentlemen, the most shocking thing for me in this book was um, when you talked about the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in April 2010, that over, get this, ladies, over 4.9 million barrels of crude oil spewed over the at least 87 days, making it the largest spill in the United States history and recorded the largest fine of $20 billion. Now, get this. The total amount of crude oil spilt represents only a little over, I, I can't believe this, six minutes, six minutes of our daily use of petroleum in the United States, while the impacts will continue for at least a generation. Am I getting that accurate? Shug, you, you, you hit on the essential question, you know, why is there so much back and forth politically? Like if you acknowledge the climate is changing, that makes you a liberal? No, it makes you literate. It makes you scientifically literate. I think the reason why there's so much pushback is because solving this requires change. And I think it's in our DNA to avoid change. It, it, it is disrupting industries and mm -hmm. jobs, and nobody wants that disruption. And yet history uh, of our life on this planet shows that the only constant is change. Mm -hmm. So the fact that fossil fuel jobs are going away, by the way, new jobs are taking their place that are safer and cleaner and better paying. So we're moving into that new clean energy economy. Some say not fast enough, but the mm -hmm. writing is on the wall. What worked in the 1970s will not work in the 2020s and the 2030s. And as a scientist, I acknowledge the data. I look at the trends. I do not worship science. I believe Genesis when God says, look, you were made in my self image. Mm -hmm. I gave you big brains the ability to think <laughs> logically, to make Praise smart God. decisions, yeah. to make things better on, on my earth and, and the good sense not to foul your nest. So the way I look at it in my brain, God gave us a toolbox with mm -hmm. an infinite supply of tools. That's science. I do not worship the toolbox. Yeah. I worship the creator who gave us the toolbox Amen. to make smart decisions. Yep. And for ladies, we're going to pause right there and tune in next week. My name is Shugbury, Him for Her Radio, Women's Hot Topics.